So we've got a good meeting lined up. Uh, today we're going to be, we got a special presentation of, of a panel talking about the economics of uh, the discharges and what they mean to the community. Uh, thanks, Blair, for putting this together. Um, of course, we'll do our progress reports and, and we got some special updates, you know, from about LOSUM and about federal agencies and state agencies and so forth. And uh, so we'll move on through the agenda. But um, just to start off with, you know, there's been a lot of attention, uh, of course, brought to the lake about the discharges and, and about particularly about the algae blooms that are covering so much of the lake and in recent past about Pahokee Marina particularly and the endangerment of those folks around there who have been exposed to a, a real high concentration of, uh, of toxic blue green algae in the lake there. So um, obviously they're locking through the, when they lock through at Port Mayaka, some of that's coming into the canal. We we're real concerned about that and uh, we're going to move forward. But before we get the panel, I, I know there's some kind of special updates and comments that Congressman Mass wanted to kind of give the group. So allow him to have the floor for a few minutes. Congressman. Hey, appreciate it, Mark. Always good to see y'all. Uh, just cover a couple of the things that are going on right now. And I'll just start with something because I know you all were speaking about it conversationally. Um, I don't know where you all are at on an emergency declaration for the lake, but and I wasn't planning to talk about it, but since I heard you all talk about it, um, I've had some conversations as well with uh, FDEP and their directors and others specifically asking that. I want to say back when uh, when Pahokee Marina first kicked off, um, saying, hey, what about an emergency declaration here? And the answer that I was given on that was simply this. Um, they do the emergency declaration as a way to release funds where there are not otherwise funds available to work on something. And they have however many dollars designated right now to deal with algal blooms, uh, which is where they're funding the cleanup on uh, in uh, Pahokee and other places as well. And that, just so you know, that was the answer I was given when I asked about there being an emergency declaration on the lake that they don't need to do that because they have the ability to move dollars uh, into cleanup places. Um, so you, you all can take that for whatever it is that you want to take it for. That's just the answer I was given. Change gears here uh, to some of my experiences. I've been to Pahokee numerous times. Uh, I take people out there on a regular basis uh, that have the ear of different people uh, around the state and around the federal government to show them just how disgusting it really is. Uh, been out to uh, Port Mayaka, Lock and Dam several times uh, over the past couple of weeks, which is equally disgusting uh, to Pahokee. And uh, one of those meetings in particular, uh, I was with a two-star general from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, brought him out there. And, you know, dealt with some of the bureaucracy that, that really set me over the edge that we deal with quite often, where it was in an unbearable state. We couldn't breathe out there so much to the point that we all said, let's go inside. We can't even stand on top of the lock and dam. Let's go inside because it's so disgusting. And even when we got inside, we couldn't escape it. There, it, it was equally disgusting inside of the buildings at the, the Port Mayaka Lock and Dam. And, and my question to them was, uh, as I've asked so many, you know, is that toxic? Is that poisonous? And they could have done any small amount of diligence and known that the, the current military head of the Corps of Engineers, uh, uh, General Spellman, he's acknowledged that it's toxic. The EPA has said eight parts per billion is a toxic level and, it, and it's measured a hundred times more toxic than that on the lake already this year, not even into summertime, not even into, in, into the heat. And uh, that the, the state in fact considered it so toxic that before they even got tests back on Pahokee, giving them the numbers on it, they went to spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to clean it up because they knew how toxic it was without the tests even coming back. So it doesn't take much diligence to figure that out. And they started go, uh, to go bureaucrat on me and say, well, listen, we're not doctors. I don't know if it's poison. And I lost my stuff on them when, it, when we started going there. But we got to a point where we were actually able to speak the same language a little bit. And, and it happened at this point where I'm looking to my left and right and there are uniformed service men and women there that are forced to work at the, the lock and dam on a regular basis, breathing that in, perhaps from 4.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. And it was at that point that the general 
actually got it. When I said, are you willing to bet your command that your person here that's, that's stationed here in uniform isn't being poisoned 12 hours a day, 10 hours a day as they sit here? Are you willing to bet your command that there's this EPA standard? It says the airborne toxins can travel up to 10 miles. And this person has no protective equipment. And, and even if they did, who would want to sit out there even with protective equipment for that? Are you willing to bet your command on that? And it was at that point that he actually got it and, and understood it to some degree um, when we brought it in that way. And this is a thread that we're working to pull on right now. I've written letters to the Secretary of the Army. I've called the Secretary of the Army. I've not heard back from them yet. I just called them last night and said very literally this. This should be an emergency situation for you, Secretary of the Army, that you have people out there in a toxic environment unprotected. And if you're not addressing it as an emergency that should have been taken care of 10 hours ago, then you're not addressing it in the right way. That is a thread that I will uh, continue to pull on um, until they resolve that situation. Uh, and and the, the final point that I'll give you on all of that is simply this. Um, we do need to do absolutely everything humanly possible to keep that out of our waterways. Uh, you know, you can go out there and if you get an eye shot of it, you can see how disgusting it is. But if you get anywhere downwind of it, you will know with, with, with absolute certainty just how poisonous and toxic uh, it is. Uh, it, it is at an unbearable level out there. Again, not even in, into summertime yet. And uh, I've said to people, listen, if they try to dump it into our community, I will anchor my boat to the St. Lucie Lock and Dam to where they will have to sink my boat directly underneath where that water flows. I don't know if it'll be the top side or the bottom side of the lock and dam yet, but that is the choice. They, they cannot poison us. We cannot allow them to poison us. Uh, and I will do everything possible to make sure I do it on my end as well. Um, and that, I don't know if anybody has, if I spurred any questions for anybody or if you just want to move on, but I'm certainly here to answer a question or two if you need. Otherwise, you guys get your time back. Thank you, Congressman. Yeah, I, I, I know that there's there's some extreme interest in having somebody at least getting out there in your caliber to get out and bring this to that attention and in that level. So we're, we're appreciative of that. I mean, this is a serious issue. It, it, it gets serious by the moment. I mean, we're about to enter hurricane season starting next Tuesday and June 1st brings with it all the rain events that we know will raise that lake level and that makes that potential discharge. Fortunately, the lake's just under 13 feet today. So we're, we're in a good situation, but not the best situation that we've been in in previous years. So we're very, very cautious moving forward and appreciate your diligence on that issue. Um, I have a question. All right, had a question? Yeah. Can I ask it, please? Um, I know um, that one of the problems is with biosolids being put on as fertilizer on farms and ranches. And then when that runs off, it goes down into Lake Okeechobee. The county, I have spoken to them um, for St. Lucie County, and they send their biosolids up to North Florida, where it is used on the farms and ranches. That when the runoff comes down uh, the Kissimmee River, it flows into Lake Okeechobee and then is sent out to us and uh, the Caloosahatchee. So we're getting it right back. Now, uh, back in 2018, there was a, a symposium from the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council uh, about biosolids and they talked about using them in equipment that made electricity. And what I'd like to know is, and it, we, it never went anywhere because it was so expensive. Um, but now I think there are funds from the federal government and the state, and I'm hoping that the, all the different communities in um, the Treasure Coast can get together um, and work to perhaps get some of this funding? Is this something you can work on? 
Yeah, anytime that there's funding out there, especially if somebody knows where it is, we're always have to swing the bat as hard as we can to find it. It really goes to a more important, uh, you know, point that Gary Goforth will yell to you all day long, accurately yell to it. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean it in a good way that there are no enforceable standards for the nutrients going into the water. And that is how Lake Okeechobee continues to get more and more and more. You know, how does it get more toxic? The most toxic in history earlier in the year, it's because it's getting worse and worse, not better and better. Uh, and, and it gives me an opportunity to just, just say a quick point that I didn't before. Um, we have representatives at every level. I'm at the federal level. Uh, there's others at the state, county, city level. And I, I didn't mention it, but this is important. Everybody from our area, in my opinion, needs to give a video or a live testimony to you all about where we stand on what should be the future of the Lake Okeechobee reg or the, the Lake Okeechobee system operating manual. Um, do you support plan A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, or E, E, and why? Because, uh, you know, everybody on this call has a voice, but there's only a few of us that actually uh, are, are in positions to make law and regulation. And in that, uh, there hasn't been law and regulation that are enforceable standards on the water going into Lake Okeechobee, um, but we definitely need to know where people stand before those that that new system operating manual gets narrowed down to one plan. Where people stand, what plan it is they're supporting, and why. Um, I support AA and CC. Um, we can get into that another time if you all want. Uh, there's many many reasons why, and it looks like just to give you a quick point on it, the the West Coast, our East Coast, and the South are largely going to coalesce around playing CC for a number of reasons, probably, um, with maybe some possible changes. But that's a lot of what it looks like right now. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Diane, there, there, I, I mean, it's an important issue and point, and we always ought to bring it up to the forefront about the disposal of biosolids and how it's causing that pollution in our in our watershed and particularly how it gets transferred to a different watershed, like we mentioned Lake Okeechobee. So we need to keep on top of that issue. It, it is a state issue and it's Florida DEP that regulates that. And we haven't gotten that regulation, even though people like the Blue Green Algae Task Force has pointed that out, that that pollution north of the lake is causing those situations to be uh, exasperated. So we definitely, recognize that as a good point, uh, whether the congressman can do specifically something about that. I think we transfer that that demand over to our state representative, particularly Secretary Valenstein for FDEP, who needs to act upon that. And as, yeah, as congressman, congressman said, all the nutrient inflows from north of the lake. But we'll I take think that. Good, good morning, everybody. Can I interrupt for a second, yeah, please? Just and I apologize. I keep it two seconds. Good morning, Congressman Mast. I've been, always been a great believer on television, and I got the local stations, ABC, CBS, and NBC. But in 2018, the next step went to the national news. And boy, everybody jumps when the this becomes a national news item. I'm not sure you have a lot, a lot of contacts. This group has a lot of contacts. May I make a suggestion being proactive, put it at that level now before it gets worse. Thank you. I mean, get the get the national the media yes. out. Yes, yes, you've yeah. been interviewed, Mark. Exactly. Thank you very much. Okay, Mark. Um, can I ask a question of Diane. Yeah. Diane, this is Darryl. Uh, uh, quickly, Mike. Mike, let's. Did you have a question we, uh, to Diane? Yeah, got to move. Um, the the 2019 ban on biosolid application in the Okeechobee watershed. How far north of Okeechobee is biosol are biosolids being applied to farmland? I'm confused about the extent of the band geographically. I know that we're sending it um, north of Brevard County, where exactly um, there is a map you can go on um, for that. You can Google uh, biosolids and bring up the map and it'll show you where it is being put down. There's, there's actually a proposal in Brevard County to spread 94 million pounds of biosolids on pasture land, oh, wow. which is in the IRL watershed. It is not necessarily St. John's Water Management District. I mean, South Florida Water Management District has responsibility south of there, but this is a big problem. 
and it's it's a sewage problem as much as it is a biosolids problem and i think that a lot of uh, plasma incineration could handle both including some of our solid waste issues and does that, that, the cost does that in almost no do time have, do, do applications there make it to the simi valley and the simi river somehow yeah yeah okay I mean, okay, so let's, let's the yeah, this is first ones to get that funding. Okay. So I'm asking all, right. all of you to contact your cities and counties and push for working to do that so that we can get this equipment here to try and help um, our situation. Okay. Um, Mark, this is Daryl. Can I interject? Um, yeah. If you have questions, can you please put them in the chat section and Mark will call on you. We actually have a couple. Yeah. I think Jackie has had a question and um, there was one other one, but if we can put it in the chat section, that way we can keep uh, the back and forth down a little bit. Go well, ahead. Yeah, let's, it's irrelevant, and I'll get there in a second, but irrelevant to the biosolids issue, and I see Paul Gray had a, had a comment in the chat, is that we're, it is a huge issue. Um, I would task, you know, Task those who have just spoken up, you know, namely Diane, James, Jim, uh, Mike, and any others to kind of work together and let's get to the bottom of the issue and try to get, you know, this back to the whole coalition in a, in a way we can communicate it out so that it, it gets there. So, Barbara, make sure you stay in touch with these folks to make sure we get a kind of a task group looking at this kind of real specific issue about biosolid distributions and where they are and how they're being affected the watershed. Um, so um, Martin, you had a question you wanted to ask Congressman Mass. Martin, yes, yes, with yes. yes. Uh, Real um, brief. I, I first wanted to that um, <clears throat> I'd like to know it, how I could participate personally in the testimony about my stand on um, one of the plans and the operations uh, uh, manual here since that topic was brought up, if that information could be put in the chat or somehow um, relayed so that it would be appreciated. Okay, and, and you know, since, you know, because of our family's proximity here in Martin County to the uh, um, uh, uh, intercoastal and how far out that this, um, you know, toxicity would, would uh, reach here, it, you know, it, it affects us uh, deeply. So what I wanted uh, uh, to point to as a question for Congressman Mask, uh, uh, I mean, and, and um, you know, in sin sincerity, since you brought up the prospect that if they are to, to release the uh, um, um, Mess into the you know open the good after you know being vetted, um, um, you know being uh, double vaccinated and, and and strong about mask mask wearing. If I could accompany on uh, 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 this uh, uh, parking ourselves in the boat there at the lock uh, 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 as an act of resistance towards that, because um, you know that's how serious I am as well. That's my I'm glad that, that that's the level of seriousness that you're at. Uh, we have a real chance here uh, to stop these discharges. Let's say, you know, increase our likelihood of not having them. I would say 80%, 80% more likely that we never get discharges again through some of these plans. It, it, and we don't know when we're going to get that chance again. Plan AA and CC are incredible for the St. Lucie. Plan, plan BB was written literally and written and turned in by two sugar lobbyists. And it calls for more discharges to the St. Lucie. And I have a great deal of anxiety that it's still in those top five plans. Um, to, the, to answer your question, you need to write a letter to the Corps. You need to write an email to the Corps. You need to give a phone call to the Corps of Engineers. You need to get every person that you know man, woman, and child, if they're old enough to hold a pencil or pick up a phone, have them call the Corps of Engineers. That's what needs to happen. I believe Mark has that contact information. I think he's putting it up right now. But we're either going to win or we're going to lose on this. But one way or another, that manual, that schedule for Lake Okeechobee 
is going to be rewritten probably sometime finalized by mid-July, maybe the end of July. And so between now and then, that's I'm telling you the same thing I tell to every HOA, every business, every person in school, I don't care. If you can hold a pencil, write a letter to the core. If you have a keyboard, write an email to the core. If you have a phone, call the core. But you need to let them know they can't poison us. And, and it's just that simple. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, we do, we do, we're going to be updating our kind of this uh, uh, communication we did back in February. Of course, we're going to update it to address their more current planning process. But Lisa Alley, who's this, these are where you send the comments. And this is her email contact. I'll get it cut and paste and put on the chat. And it, as you said, Martin, any individual can do that. Uh, Mark, Jackie, I, I you, know you're trying to get going yeah. on your meeting. Uh, and I'm, I apologize that we threw a wrench into it. Um, but just an important point, there are people that live with their head in the sand. And, and I know I don't have to tell that to you all. You know, there's a guy on a board, uh, JJ Sasser, a couple of weeks ago when Pahokee kicked off, uh, said, oh, well, we used to jump in this stuff all the time. That was his quote to the news. Oh, we used to jump yeah. in this stuff all the time. No big deal, right? There was, uh, you know, people the other day, uh, you know, putting up posts uh, that I see, you know, tagging me and, oh, you know, showing a picture of a beautiful spot on Lake Okeechobee. Fantastic that there's a beautiful spot on Lake Okeechobee and you can say it's not really that bad. But just because you find a pretty spot doesn't mean that the, the satellite imagery doesn't show a hundred mile bloom sitting on the lake. And, and the folks that are on the other side of it, you can believe are doing every single thing that they can to make sure that they get the BB plan that sends more discharges into the St. Lucie, that dries out the Everglades, and that screws the Caloosahatchee two times a year. We need to do everything that we can. I cannot emphasize Thanks. it enough. Thanks. Uh, Jackie Thurlipish will take one more kind of question and move on. You there? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, are okay. you good? Great. Um, I just wanted to note that Congressman Brian Mast is contacting every governing board member and trying to speak with him or her. He has spoken at the governing board meetings uh, themselves, uh, particularly last meeting. Um, one has to keep in mind that he's it. You know, the representatives, the congressional representative on the West Coast wrote a letter with about four others that asked the Army Corps to, um, you know, be more cognizant of water supply, nothing about the estuaries. Um, Brian Mast is a one man show as far as all the work that he is giving. So I just encourage everybody to reach out, you know, to people you know across the, the lake too, um, to help them in any way you can, or if you know any of the um, representatives that are over there, because we need uh, a chorus and uh, you know, I thank Brian, but I also, I feel sorry for the people that don't have a, a hero uh, who's speaking out like he is. And we're very fortunate. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, uh, Jackie. Uh, let's, um, we appreciate Congressman being here, and, and of course, any of our representatives or, or folks to be here and, and help us move through uh, what we need to do to fight for clean water in, in the St. Lucie Estuary and Indian River. Um, let's move on. Uh, we've got a special presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Blair, Blair Wickstrom. We've got a special panel that you want to introduce and get queued up. Well, I think. Uh... Clearly, I couldn't have had a better setup to what I'd like to talk to you about today is the economic impacts of that toxic uh, bloom that we have just on the other side of uh, the Port Maaca Dam. And so um, in 2018, and this is, this is to essentially, it lines straight up with what uh, the Congressman was saying in terms of that aerosolized uh, toxicity to the, to the bloom. In 2018, like the, the Army, um, who is keeping their people working there, I closed our office. I had to close our office on the South Fork of the St. Lucie River because of the toxicity. The work environment was toxic. People were sick. I had to close the office. We have subsequently sold 
that building that we're in for 20 years uh, because I didn't want to chance that again. So the economic impact is significant. And that's what we're talking about today. It's real. And, and, and it's sort of like if we knew what the, the economic fallout of the uh, COVID pandemic was going to be in January of last year. So think about that before it ever happened. If we knew what was going to happen, I imagine we would have acted. We would have proactively got in front of that and mitigated what it did to our country over the last 15 months. It's sort of akin to what we're doing now, knowing that we've got this toxicity, this 500 square miles of toxic water in the lake, and we're not effectively doing anything about it. We're talking about it. We're, we have a few people that are, that are really rattling some cages, but we're not effectively making change to stop this from happening again. And so we're talking about the, the issues that are gonna affect us health-wise. Today, we're gonna to talk about it economically because a lot of governments run on economics because they're potentially more in tune with what it's gonna to mean to them in their, in their pocket versus what it's gonna mean uh, health-wise, the environment, the ecology. A lot of times it takes the back seat to dollars and dollars and cents. And so um, cents and being, you could spell it just about any way you want. It's not good sense to pollute your economic driver in Florida, which is tourism. And, uh, and that's what we're gonna talk about today because we don't wanna end up, and if you can see this close sign, we don't wanna end up with a lot of close signs this summer because we didn't act now. And these are ads, this, this is another full page ad that Rivers Coalition paid for. And this is Pahokee Marina. This is the blue green algae that's in the lake right now. It's at Port Mayaka. It's what's causing potentially hazardous work conditions for our US uh, personnel that are working the lock. So we're trying to do what we can. And today we have some some strong uh, uh, local leaders that are gonna come out and they're gonna talk to you about it. We should have more. There should be a line of people that own businesses, that run businesses, that work for businesses to talk about the economic fallout by not fixing the water. We have got to fix the flow or we're gonna break our businesses. And uh, so we have three businesses uh, that are going to represent both local and more of a global approach. Uh, Ed Stout, he's the owner of South uh, River Outfitters. He had to move off the river because he could no longer do rental businesses, uh, rental trips. Mm -hmm. So now he's on US-1. He's an advocate for uh, obviously a clean uh, water type living. I mean, you can't kayak uh, inches above toxic water. It isn't going to work. His business is directly affected by the, uh, the, the sort of the health of the lake and the, and the river and the estuary. Uh, another uh, business that will be greatly impacted that we don't hear more from is real estate, real estate values. Our organization up. We lost you, but we lost you for a second there. Um, all right. Um, We're having a yeah. tough time hearing you, so if you could speak yeah, up. If you could uh, uh, move, maybe move a little closer to your microphone, Blair. Okay. Um, how is, is this any better? It's better, yeah. Okay. Just repeat the real estate point, if you could, because that's important, and that's where we lost. Well, with, with again, the, the Rivers Coalition sued the Army Corps in 2007 over the the, the riparian rights of waterfront property owners. And, uh, and so you would think there would be a, a standing line of realtors that are basically saying, we can't have this. You know, this is not the way that we're going to, uh, you know, sell, be able to sell real estate in our community. And we have Steph Hughes, who's a lifetime 30 year plus local uh, realtor uh, that lived through all of the lost summers 
and uh, wants to tell you about it. And then eventually uh, we're gonna talk to an executive from the Marriott uh, industry, a, a, a former executive with both uh, the Marriott and Renaissance and has also worked for the, uh, the US Travel uh, Agency, Travel Association, and uh, to give us a little broader perspective. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll toss it to uh, Ed. Are you, uh, are you ready to? I'm here. Awesome. Thanks, Ed. Definitely. I uh, appreciate you guys having me. And, um, you know, we've definitely had some impacts over the years. We're just hitting our 20th year in business in Martin County here. And I think the first taste of it was in 2005 uh, when we were, had, had some issues with our summer camp. We used to run our summer camp that ran all summer long. We would launch out of uh, Sanskrit Park and we took 18 kids a week and taught them how to kayak and taught them, you know, the special attributes of our, our beautiful St. Lucie River and the estuary. And uh, that was the first year we had to cancel the camp. And then uh, it came to, I think it was 2016 is when we first started having them again. And that year, you know, same thing. We had uh, a full load of campers ready to go. We had to cancel the whole camp. We had that three years in a row and we finally decided not to hold the camp anymore. It just wasn't feasible for us to do all the planning, hire all the staff, get all the equipment and then have to send everybody home. And it was a big disappointment. Um, we were still out at Halpatioke Park at that time on the upper reaches of the St. Lucie River. And at that point, um, you know, we had a rental business also. Ran into the same thing with the rental business. You know, when you when you rent kayaks, the insurance is your expensive part. To make that profitable, you have to turn lots of numbers. And that's seats and boats throughout the year. And when you can't use the river for six months of the year, you can't turn those numbers to make a profit. And if you can't make a profit, you just don't do that anymore. You know, and we kept it uh, open as long as we could. Um, unfortunately, we had to cancel the whole rental operations. Um, we ended up having to move out of there for, for other reasons with the county. But um, when we were looking for a new home, we decided not to look for anywhere on the water because it just wasn't feasible to operate a rental business anymore when we have the prospects of the river being closed for six months at a time. And, you know, I, I'm kind of glad because right now I would be looking at that same prospect. We're all fighting to keep that algae away from us, but unfortunately, I, I believe it's just going to happen. You know, the rain's going to come. I've been in Florida my whole life. It's going to rain this summer. The lake's going to fill up and, you know, um, I hate to say it, but it's, it's coming. You know, it's just, just what I believe. Um, I'd love to have somebody prove me wrong, but, um, but, you know, we're surviving. We had to adapt. Uh, but it definitely had to change our business. And unfortunately, not only do I lose out in having a business where I can be on the water, but hundreds of kids in Martin County don't get to enjoy that experience. And hundreds of tourists, hundreds of thousands of tourists that we used to, you know, um, have come by our operation every year would not be able to enjoy that. And one of the things I would do when those tourists would come and visit us, I would show them the big map of the river how the system works and explain to them that, you know, sometimes we get this bad algae and you need to go home and talk to your congressman and your, you know, representatives, because when this stuff's at the federal level, they're right. We've got Brian Mast fighting for us against 50 other states or 49 other states and their needs. So, you know, the education that I was doing there and that you know, Mark does at his uh, operation is super important because not only is it a local fight, it's a national fight. We need that national funding, we need state funding, we need the county funding and everybody working together. Um, so I'm just, you know, kind of bummed out that we don't get that opportunity to educate everybody anymore. The business isn't out there anymore. It's affected me financially. And, you know, that, that's really where we're at right now. And, and unfortunately, I don't see an end. You know, we, we're sitting, algae's at the door right now. It's, it's a couple of rainstorms away for me. So I, again, appreciate you allowing me to speak. Um, you know, and that's, that's where well, we're thanks. at. Huh? Thanks for your story, Ed. I, but I don't want you to give up. We're not giving up. Don't give up. We can, right now is the chance to stop it. We can send water south. We have the capacity in the STAs 
right now the, the state is claiming that they're offline for you know being worked on but we can send water south by by contacting lisa ailey you've got the the phone numbers here in the chat you've also got all the information is in the ads from rivers coalition on who to contact i think we can make a difference you know it's probably going to rain we're probably going to potentially see the uh the worst summer we ever had but maybe not but we can't work on luck and maybes. We we have to make change, and that's that's what we're we're working for. And if we can get all of our associations, all of our our, our people, calling this phone number, calling the core, sending signing the petition to fix the flow, I think we have a chance. So don't give up on us. I'm not giving up. That that's one thing for sure. No, that's great, and and I really appreciate it, Ed, and and. Uh, you know, next I'd like to hear from Steph, uh, a local realtor that uh, has also lived through uh, all of the uh, the disastrous uh, lost summers over the last decade. Thank you, Blair. And thank you all for your uh, steadfast and um, constant hard work. Um, I think having lived through this as a uh, child and growing up on the St. Lucie River, um, it's easy to get weary. Uh, a lot of people have. A lot of people have um, participated in this uh, war and battle that we're in and uh, just kind of gotten burnt out. So I, I am so grateful for all of you and um, your, your diligence, um, your perseverance and um, you know, mo most of all that we've gotten to the point where we are, where this has, has gotten uh, a lot of attention. It's a, it's, it's a bittersweet thing, but it's actually um, getting closer to where we need to be. And um, coming from a realtor's perspective, I just wanna share a couple um, things, including new, new residents who visit our area, they, um, they really rely on realtors. It's, it's a resource um, for many that uh, is the only resource given in coming to a new, new uh, location. And surely we can direct them to subcontractors um, within our industry, within the community, um, you know, kind of chamber and community e events and things like that. But but they, they rely on realtors um, for things that you wouldn't, wouldn't expect. In fact, I've, I've uh, counseled people through some things that I, I wonder if they think we're just all knowing. But um, one of the things for sure would be that, that uh, sharing information that they may not be aware of by just uh, you know, Googling Martin County, Florida or looking at um, you know, information on the internet. But, um, it is so damning. It's such a damning factor that could, um, you know, catapult our our values, which would catapult our tax base um, for the uh, general public and newcomers to come upon information about living in a poison town, um, living in a town uh, with, like we've discussed, toxicity. Um, I can't imagine anything more that could collapse uh, our real estate industry than um, another uh, another flow of of uh, you know green um, poison, and um, I just really can't imagine it happening again. And it looks like it may very well be the case. Um, in in addition. Uh, as a realtor, I think we are more than ever uh, required to disclose things about um, a real estate transaction. And we do have a written disclosure. I, I spoke about the, the moment that um, uh, some years ago when uh, basically the waterways were completely closed down. Um, our, recreation in Martin County was completely disabled and uh, we're on the verge of, of um, sick human beings and, and dying pets and very serious um, 
medical repercussions. And uh, our agency had a kind of roundtable discussion about adding um, the river's uh, health to our disclosure that we distribute to buyers before they purchase. And I had mentioned that in addition to thinking, my goodness, this will certainly drive many, many people away and why wouldn't it? Um, I also felt whether or not this disclosure is put in writing and we're required to distribute it, I believe that I owe it to uh, residents approaching our county or, or inquiring about our county. I, I think it's necessary uh, and morally responsible. Um, I showed property last week and spoke with some people visiting from New York and I asked them, are you aware of the state of our river? And they didn't. And um, as we discussed it, um, they became kind of back offish, literally um, backing up a little bit and looking at each other. And um, so whether the word's out or not, real estate, the values, realtors um, who are employed and all of the trickle down businesses, title companies, mortgage companies, surveyors, subcontractors, contractors, it just goes on and on and on. If the, the value of our properties plummet because of us living in a poisonous town, you can bet that economically the suffering will continue. Um, I also wanted to share a rather specific um, instance, only one, I have others. Um, I've been hired by people who have asked me to sell their homes because they wanted to be off the river, um, off canals, um, but very specifically marketing a, a difficult um, home off Fraser Creek in Shepherd's Park. I experienced the buyer coming for the third time to uh, make their final decision to, to work on, uh, on submitting an offer on, on the property that I had listed. And they um, <clears throat> had been on the market some time too. This, this seller really needed to sell. And it, it wasn't a market that we were experiencing quite like now, but uh, on, on, the, on the delta of the Fraser Creek heading into the mooring of downtown Stewart, I was astounded, quite honestly, at a green sign coming our way. It, it looked like it was, um, you know, just a, a flow, uh, a very distinctive line of bright green scum. And wouldn't you know, that scum continued into Fraser Creek with an incoming tide, um, disturbed the buyer substantially, and they later, um, said we have no intention of buying real estate here and they moved on um, to something a little bit further south where they felt the water was clean and safe. Um, I mean that that took a lot of money out of my pocket, the seller's pocket and uh, a good deal of, of others. So the probably the other than medically speaking, the impact on the toxicity of our river um, is is such a um, could very well be the most devastating economic loss Martin County has ever experienced with most of our county being water. Um, I, th I think I might be wrong, but I think it's 14% of our, 44% of our county is water. If you look at the county and the mass geographically, but whatever the case may be, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I am concerned as many realtors are um, you can imagine there's also that, that group out there that is concerned, but, but God forbid we actually um, do put it in our disclosure. We actually do bring it to buyer's attention, attention and then we lose business. So you can imagine the moral um, predicament we're in also. Thank you, Steph. Um, you know, our local, uh, both city, county, and state representatives need to hear this. It's this is, you know, this is the truth and this is what's gonna to happen to us economically here locally. Um, but it also affects us 
you know, from a state level, which trickles down to affecting us. And, and that's where I'd like to have Gary Oster, um, a former VP uh, with the Marriott Renaissance chain. He's gonna talk a little bit about the travel industry and how an impact not only affects us here when we have the discharges in our backyard, but it affects the whole state. And uh, so Gary, um, welcome to Rivers Coalition. Uh, thank you, Blair. Thanks for your invitation today. And it's, it's a pleasure to be in front of uh, all of you uh, very wise and, and experienced uh, folks. Um, yeah, my name's Gary Oster. I've spent over 50 years in the travel industry and my wife and I uh, live in Souls Point. And if you're not aware, the travel industry uh, employs 15 million people in the United States. It generates $2.3 trillion worth of economic benefit for our country. Travel is one of the top employers in nearly every state in the nation. But in Florida, it is recognized the number one in, as the number one industry for jobs, revenues, and a top tax generator for municipalities as well as the state. During uh, the five decade span of my career in travel, I have experienced numerous recessions, stock market and banking crises, pandemics such as SARS, H1N1, COVID-19, terrorist attacks like 9-11, Oklahoma City, Mandalay Bay Massacre, Paris, London, Madrid, earthquakes, hurricanes like Katrina, Wilma, Andrew, Charlie, and wildfires, way too many of those on the West Coast to mention. And unfortunately, many man-made disasters, such as the Three Mile Island, and more recent, the BP Horizon Gulf oil spill. Each of these seismic events had measurable duration, impact, and scale on a local, regional, and national level. Not only were they just localized, I mean, they, they, were, they were felt by individual citizens, businesses, governments, and economies. Again, can't, we, we keep hearing the word impact. We cannot misunderstand or, or diminish impact, duration, and scale. Each time one of these natural or man-made disasters take place, the clock stops and resets for each of these local, regional, and national economies. Let's uh, just use the BP Horizon oil rig disaster as, a, as an example. That was 2010. Okay, this is, this is probably one of the worst things that uh, we could have done to our ecology and our economy. This disaster took place, as you all know, off the coast of Louisiana, caused monumental declines in the tourism industry from New Orleans to the Outer Banks. That's right, the Outer Banks. You go, how, how is that possible? Well, according to a study by TripAdvisor, they have 47 million monthly uh, visitors. The Outer Banks saw a 15% decline in page views and corresponding bookings during the first 20 days of the disaster. How is that possible? It's so far north and so far in another body of water because people have perception issues. They, they don't necessarily understand exactly how geography works. We're gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute. The actual impact on the travel, retail, entertainment, and restaurant sectors for the state of Florida during the BP Horizon oil disaster was in the billions and billions of dollars. That's billions of dollars of lost wages, lost revenues, and lost taxes. And according to a study by Oxford Economics, cities on the Gulf and Atlantic coast saw a drop by as much as 65% in destination tourism business, even though they were not impacted or far away from the impact zone. How does this happen? Two reasons. First reason, the media. It's no secret that the media thrives on the three Ds of disaster, death, and destruction. We only need to think as recently as the past year regarding the barrage of coverage every minute of every day related to COVID-19. The media loves a big disaster and can't wait to have 24 seven coverage with photos, videos, and testimonials of and from its victims. And then there's the second thing, geography. Most of us are not equipped to know the exact location of many of Florida's various destinations, especially Americans from thousands of miles away, or worse yet, travelers who are 
looking to come to Florida from overseas. For example, if people within or outside our state hear, read, see something about a Florida algae outbreak in Fort Myers or in Stewart, they perceive the entire state of Florida has been impacted. This perception impact is real and quickly causes a softening of a key indicator called intent to travel which is the future lifeblood of business bookings for the travel industry. Why does this matter? Quite simply, the impact of another disastrous summer of algae bloom will seriously impact not only the tourism industry, but retail, entertainment, dining, and many other tangential industries as well. The worst part is these very same businesses are still trying to get back on their feet after dealing with 15 months of pandemic declines. We just don't seem to learn our lesson. The improper management and subsequent disastrous effects of the Lake Okeechobee water level is just another example of how two large sugar companies, a multitude of elected local, county, state, federal officials, the US Army Corps of Engineers, and sad to say, even a few chambers of commerce put greed, corruption, self-interest at the expense of wildlife, aquatic life, human life, and our economic life. The impact is great. The scale could be disastrous and the duration, as long as people can remember, just like the last time this happened, which could be two to three more years. So thank you for your time. I really hope uh, I can play a role in the future in, in helping bring some of the strategy and some of the voice of sanity to light. And I, again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Gary. Um, as we all know, it's this is a uh, this is a disaster of our own making. I mean, we we have to as a group. We are the, the the tip of the spear here, and we've been impacted more than anyone else with these toxic discharges, the mismanagement of our water, the 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 craziness that that a, a sugar corporation could infiltrate our chamber. We have somewhat allowed this. So again, from an economic standpoint, it's clear we've got to end it. From a health standpoint, uh, we all realize that we have to fix this. So in any case, I, I really appreciate you panelists from coming in because a lot of people didn't want to come. People from the restaurant, waterfront, uh, restaurant owners, hotel operators, they were afraid to speak up because they don't want to potentially uh, chase off or lose business by talking now. I mean, we are for the first time talking in advance of a pending sort of disaster. And uh, unless we got really, really lucky, we're gonna get it. And so we have a chance to make change now. And uh, so I appreciate uh, the panelists, you guys for, for coming in and, and for uh, obviously Mark and everybody else for doing what you do. Congressman Brian Mast, a hero. Um, the, the, the political will that's necessary for change we have an example in D.C. We need that in Tallahassee. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, uh, Blair. We'd like to sure thank the panelists and them stepping forward, like you said. And I recall back in years when Fort Myers and others over on the West Coast were in the Fort Myers Beach, people were saying, we don't want to talk about it because it is, a, a you know, it's going to deter a lot of people from coming here. And that's yeah. unfortunate, but that's the facts. So we needed to yeah. bring this out, see how much impact. We, we may have a few questions. Uh, if you want, uh, we can take a few real quick and then we'll move on. Um, is there anybody on the that wants to have a question for the panel or group? Mark, I have one. This is this is Eve yeah, Samples. Yeah. Hi. Eve Samples, go ahead. Thank you to the panel. Really interesting and informative. And thanks, Steph, for the ethical approach you bring to selling real estate. I, I know it's not mandated, but it's so important. So as you all know, we are out lobbied by the polluting industries. And I'm wondering what you think, Steph, about how the Florida Association of Realtors could better help on our issue. And then I have the same question for Gary in terms of how maybe Visit Florida or even the Florida Chamber might be able to come around and help us. So I'll toss it to Steph first, please. Um, well, I'm probably naive in this attitude, but um, Jackie and, and I and uh, all, uh, many of us were at the Kane Center many years ago and um, 
And, and Jackie, actually, I'll never forget it because I, I thought, well, great, this is our solution. Um, when she mentioned the elephant in the room and in its eminent domain. <laughs> and I know that's, oh my goodness, how could you, you, you dare say that? But with um, us being silenced because of one reason or the other, uh, I don't know that the Florida Association of Realtors uh, quite fairly, Eve, have taken a stance on this. I would imagine just like I think of a, a, a prominent local realtor who, who um, started the charge or, or was, was uh, really, um, uh, you know, had, had stood up and, and really um, brought attention to the matter and was rather chastised because of it. And I, I think he's kind of gone into the shadows because um, it, again, it's, it's the type of thing where uh, bringing attention to the matter is also gonna maybe take money out of our pockets. But um, I know at the Board of Realtors on Tuesday mornings, it was discussed. I know that there was a, a lot of campaigning uh, towards um, candidates that were going to be uh, supportive of, of uh, you know, action. And um, I also um, know that there was a lot of letters and solicitations and, and uh, ruffled feathers over it as we saw things um, really, you know, um, getting bad. I don't know if that helps, but, um, you know, I, I, I think that it's, uh, uh, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, and um, I'm happy to inquire further, but I have a feeling that the Florida Association of Realtors does not see the seriousness of this like maybe we do. So, uh, Eve, it's, it's a great question. You know, it's, it, it's kind of like pay me now or pay me later, right? <laughs> Reactive, proactive. Uh, I think the, uh, in fact, Blair and I have had this conversation. Um, I would rather be involved in a strategy that's, that's going to attack the problem before it becomes out of control, or once it does get spinning, we can manage it to spin it our way. Mm -hmm. um, the comments are correct. The, the hotel guys are not gonna wanna say, we're about to embark on a season of bloom and bloom is not a good thing. And uh, the restaurant guys aren't gonna wanna talk about it either because they just, they. They need to get their businesses back on foot. So it's a, it is a bit of a quandary. The one thing that you may actually have more power than what you think is not necessarily with visit Florida, but we have an opportunity to make this a Florida problem um, from, a, from a tourism point of view. Uh, it, it's all you gotta do is harken back to the BP oil spill. And I, I spent 13 years as an executive vice president with US Travel Association in Washington. And Florida was getting crushed uh, by this, this spill even before any tar balls hit the beach because bookings just, just dropped. And what we had to do is change the narrative so that it wasn't, it wasn't just a Louisiana problem or because it wasn't part of the Gulf Shores problem, but it was a national problem and a national perception problem for audiences, not only in the US, but overseas. When, when that oil spill started impacting non-impacted areas, all of a sudden people were realizing, hey, you're, you're making this a problem for me and it's not a problem for me. And I, I can't get a voice loud enough to tell you my beach is clean. And so, there may be a time, I don't know when it's, whether it's next week or next month or the next time that we start forming coalitions outside just rivers people and that we really take it to the shoreline um, because it's at some point you got to say it, what's good for one is good for all. And I don't really necessarily have in my mind the approach. Smarter people than me could probably figure that out but really a broader strategy that is more just central waterway here in Florida is probably what's, what's really needed. And it has, to be, it has to be an attack. I can tell you over multiple things like my list that I just read of incidents and, and disasters that I've been involved in that impacted the, the travel industry. When it came to bad public policy, the best medicine 
was to make it radioactive so no politician was going to go and try to go the other way. And when you made it personally in district a problem, all of a sudden things changed. And so we got to figure out, I think, how to take this toxicity and make it so radioactive for elected officials, even though sugar daddies got hand and money into their pockets and purses. And that, you know, some, in some cases, these elected officials are prostituting themselves on behalf of that industry. We, we got to figure out a way to just call it out and not be scared. Because this is, again, this is wildlife, aquatic life, human life, and economic life. That's a good point. Thank you, uh, thank you Gary. Uh, we got another quick question by Richard, and then we'll kind of move on. But I, I did want to share kind of the fact that we, you know, that back in 2015, the Florida Realtors had an impact on water quality in both uh, Lee County and Martin County. And in this report, as you, as you might recall, they really kind of focused on the two areas is Lee County's aggregate property value is estimated 541, that impact, and then for 428 million for Martin County's value. So there was a, a serious economic impact and, and the realtors at that time came up with this, this final report, which is really a good one. Uh, go ahead, Richard, and, and then uh, we'll okay. kind of wrap it up it, here. Thanks. It's kind of a two part. One is for Gary. Uh, my sister kind of works in the hotel business. Uh, and somebody at, was asking her what was wrong with the river. She started to answer and the management said, we want to talk to you now. Brought her in the back and said, you open your mouth once more about the water and you will be fired. So if you can't get the word out from where you're working because the travel people won't let you talk about it, then how do you do anything? And the other one is for Steph uh, about, you know, realty and that, realtors and that. Uh, and I don't understand, there's a lot of building going on in Stewart and Martin County. And I can't understand why anybody would want to rent or buy some of the property when they know what all the problems are. And is there anything that could be done? Go ahead. That's a good question. So go I'll go first and then turn it over to Steph because I think mine's a really short answer. Uh, great point, Richard. At the end of the day, it's about the narrative. We need a strategy that clearly designs, defines, and articulates the narrative that we, by industry and by community, are going to all sing, basically the hymnal we're all going to sing from. So in the case of the lodging industry, and again, I spent uh, 37, almost 38 years in the hotel business, I, I, I understand saying the wrong thing can have wrong implications. That means it becomes incumbent upon us to design the right thing to say. And so that, that's what we have to do. This is a multi, to, to wage a, a war like what we're trying to do, and I, I give all of you credit because you're being proactive, you, there's, there's a playbook that has to incorporate many things. And the narrative by industry becomes one of those critical elements. And, and there has to be this consistent thread that goes through that narrative for every single industry, whether it's the entertainment industry, the realtors, the, uh, the, the, the folks that the, they talk to the public all the time in the restaurants, the hotels, that thread has to be consistent. And that's where your pressure starts building because there's so many voices, the, the two companies and the Army Corps of Engineers will not be able to out, out magnify hundreds of thousands of voices, as long as they're all saying the same thing. Thank, thank you very much, guys. Uh, there is a, a, one question in the chat by Greg, Ron, I believe in, in answer by Jim, is that there, is there a way to kind of pull together all the economic impacts and the overall water quality problems in our area? And we maybe could do that or to work on that. Um, 
you know, if I, if I look at um, kind of what I've been presenting before, and this was done by Martin County many years back, back in 2016, 15, 16, that it outlines over $840 million annual impact um, of Martin and St. Lucie County with the sales and marinas, personal income, tourism, and not to mention property values. And then the, the, other, the other was to basically, again, there's been Indian River Lagoon economic impacts um, updated since this time. And also I mentioned the Florida Realtor study. So there is a, a probably a need to, to really pull together the economic impacts. But again, I wanna thank the panel for bringing all this to our attention and, and bringing it up. Um, we're going to kind of move on now for the rest of the updates, but again, thanks for all your input. Uh, thanks, we'll start with Martin County, go to City of Stewart, and then the Water Management District. Um, Martin County, I guess, Diane Hughes, you're here. Um, yes, for John. thank you. Go ahead. Can everyone hear me clearly? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Give us an update. Greetings. So since we haven't had any Lake Okeechobee discharges since about April 9th or 10th, um, things are actually looking pretty good in the estuary and Indian River Lagoon. And I don't know if I've ever talked about it before, but I take um, information from five different um, Indian River Lagoon observatory um, stations that they have. Two in the Indian River Lagoon and three in the middle estuary in the north and south forks. Salinity is looking good in both the IRL and the estuary. Chlorophyll levels um, which is normally they use sometimes that they're not, um, uh, what do you call it, Mark? They're not sure if the chlorophyll A levels really correlate with um, blooms or not. They're all low at all five stations except for near the inlet. They're like 51 and 40 is where they thought you would expect to have a bloom. So why they would be so high at the inlet, that's strange. And somebody else can answer that. I'm not an expert on chlorophyll A. Dissolved oxygen levels look good through the IRL and, and the estuary. Um, turbidity levels are good at all the stations except for the South Fork. And we think that's due to um, the dredging that's occurring with the Okeechobee waterway and why we might have some turbidity issues there. And then um, the temperatures, you know, I converted the Celsius to Fahrenheit the estuary and Indian are around 80 to 81 degrees. The water is hot. So it's perfect for local blooms if we have enough nutrients, even if Lake Okeechobee waters don't come toward us. So we need to make sure no one's fertilizing their lawns or doing anything like this this time of year. Um, and our field staff have made some great observations. Apparently, you could see all the way to the bottom in the intercoastal waterway. They, um, Jackie reported in her blog that there's been a baby conch seen on the sandbar, as well as Halapala and Johnson's um, seagrass is about two to three inches tall. Oh, I saw that, Mark, I understood it. Okay, um, really that's all I have to report right now. The one, um, Observatory in the IRL Jensen Beach seemed to have a some suspect and bad information on it. So I might call Orca and see if they have some sensors that aren't working clearly on on that one observatory. And that's all I have. Thank you, Diane. Appreciate it very much. Um, moving on, City of Stewart. I I think Ben Hogarth had to kind of step out, but Commissioner Math uh, Matheson, can you give us some updates, City of Stewart? Thank you. Sure. Um, you know, I don't have too many updates on, on local water quality or any of that. Um, I just want to stress uh, what Congressman Matt had stressed that, that low sum, you know, it, it's constantly changing with the, the modeling plans, but we're down now to five plans. And this is a way for, for the tourism industry, the Board of Realtors, uh, to stress the importance of the problem. In a, in a way where you're not affecting your dollar in the near term future. Lothsome is far enough out where you can raise the issue, get behind a model. Um, as Congressman Mass said, and many of the local groups, uh, East Coast, West Coast, um, are trending more towards 
uh, backing plan CC. But, you know, the voice to get behind that plan needs to go well beyond um, anything we've ever seen before, basically. Um, and even though I, I disagree with the argument that you want to kind of hide the issue to protect your short-term dollar and not tell people, and I congratulate Steph and Greg um, and Ed, you know, for having the, the morals enough to, to raise the current issue and inform people about the river. Um, if we don't do that, if we don't admit the problem right away, we're not ever gonna solve it. But there's no doubt that, that people do disagree with that argument. But getting behind Lowsome and talking about the future, the next 10 years of Lake Okeechobee management, there's no excuse for any organization not to get behind a plan that will protect the long-term future of our river. Losom's not about this summer, it's about the future. So, you know, I, I'd really love to see the, the Board of Realtors, the tourism industry, and anyone here who's connected to a larger organization to, to get with me, um, get with others, uh, and we can help instruct and, and work together to really have a strong voice about the models that are best for the St. Lucie Estuary and the Everglades and the Caloosahatchee. Um, that, that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you, Merritt. Uh, appreciate it, Commissioner. Uh, let's move on to uh, kind of, I see Jackie Thurlipish is on with the uh, South Florida Water Management Report. Thank you for being here today, uh, Jackie. Thank you for having What's me up? here today. It's good to see everybody. I hear next month we might see each other in person. That'll be nice. Um, just a, a few things, uh, review of our last meeting, the governing board meeting, the biggest thing that I remember is that uh, the district okayed uh, a STA project for algae removal, basically, or, you know, nutrient removal north of Lake Okeechobee. And it's kind of in the area of Taylor Creek, Newman Slough, which is um, Basin 191. And I do believe part of this was Todd, my brother, and Gary Goforth's maps when we were like plastering those all over the front, you know, um, a year and a half ago, two years ago, just, you know, talking again about with maps, you can show like everybody knows it you know, the, the areas that have the highest levels. And so that is the area where the, the district is uh, investing a ton of money to um, help reduce that. I have a intrinsic problem with that too. And I did talk about that at the meeting. And it's just like, you know, if you're not cleaning it up at the source, what are we doing? And are, how much money are we gonna spend, you know, like, doing all these projects, because that's all that the district is really allowed to do, basically, after they crushed us in 40E61 last year, uh, with House Bill 5003 saying the district can't do anything that's like regulatory, that's all DEP, the triangle that's not working. So the bottom line is, it was a big deal that the district put a lot of money into a project north of the lake. The agriculture community and the areas up there were super happy, of course, you know, and that, that is wonderful. But we've got to work on these B maps and the dysfunction of the triangle and our source pollution problems, or we're just spinning our wheels. Um, the second thing, of course, is low sum, and that is heating up hard, as you all know. And um, they told us to reserve June 29th uh, because they're thinking that will be the day for the workshop. It's going to be a six to eight hour long workshop. That date is not um, a hard date yet, but you can put that um, there. Uh, it just happens to be my birthday. So <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to make sure I get a birthday present out of that day if it kills me. Um, and uh, you know, you'll hear a lot of different messages with Lowsum. The bottom line is to get involved. My top goal is, um, of course, to improve the St. Lucie River, but also to keep the relationship between the East and West 
because that's where I started. That's where the earliest of us, not like Mark, who's been in this, you know, since high school, but those of us who came, like me, who came in in 2008, 2012, we had the Sugarland Rally in Clewiston with Justin Riney and we got East and West together. And I felt like that lifting up that bonding of East and West is what gave us um, a better voice, a stronger voice and friendship and motivation to work together. We will be better off working as sister estuaries, even if we have to give and take a little bit in that process because we will not achieve our goals alone. Even with Brian Mast, we will not achieve our goals alone. We have to have uh, you know, a family of um, entities around the lake. And I think that primary family is our long-term sister family, the Calusahatchee. Um, the um, last thing would be just to, um, you know, to commend the district on cleaning up at Pahokee Marina. But again, you know, how, long, how much are we gonna clean up? I said, are we gonna turn into a vacuum company? You know, you've got all these great people at the district with these high level, um, you know, degrees and, uh, you know, a lot of them are in charge of cleaning up algae. Apparently, they're going to start cleaning it up on the Caloosahatchee today or tomorrow. You know, as bad as things are here, you guys, we are better off than them. You know, they took the water uh, when we weren't taking it because the algae was already on our side. They've got red tide. They've got algae by Alva. They've got algae at uh, S79. You know, it's, I'm not saying that we just, we do have to, we should do what we can do to, to help. And then when we need help, they'll be there to help us. And together we can have a better lake schedule for sure. And Brian Mast is just off the chart um, working for uh, the St. Lucie River. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, appreciate it. Um, I know there were some discussions too at the governing board last, uh, Thursday week ago about the, um, about the NEEP, the Northern Everglades Estuaries Protection Plan and, and particularly about you know about renewing that that charge to that plan, and I hope we can get the district behind that, along with the other two agencies involved in that. And that is the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and and FDAX, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. So that's that three-legged stool, and I appreciate you keep hammering hammering away at that at the governing board meetings, um, folks. I know a lot of us attend the governing board meeting virtually now, and hopefully in person soon, but if you can, please be on there. Please help make public comments because there's a lot of other people making public comments that uh, kind of get get them off off course here. And I, I think Jackie and others have been keeping keeping the governing board on course, and hopefully, we can keep her um, vigilant and go forward. Thank you very much for reporting today. Um, I don't know of other agencies that are on the uh, FDP Corps of Engineers or FWC today. They're certainly invited and we certainly ask for them to come on board, but we have with us uh, our keynote expert on Lake Okeechobee, Dr. Paul Gray. Dr. Gray, why don't you give it a whirl? Here. Mark, Thanks. yeah. Well, the good news about the lake is it dropped below 13 feet um, this week and it's been an extremely dry uh, May and so it's dropped more than a foot. And what that means is that, you know, the core their rule of thumb is they don't want to go below uh, or they don't want to go above 17 feet. So we have about four feet of freeboard to work with this summer. Um, and that's pretty good news. If, if it's not real wet in May and, or, or June and July, we could go into the, the peak of the hurricane season, you know, somewhere around 13 or 14 feet, which would put us in a good position to avoid releases. So it's going to be kind of up to mother nature. But I, I think getting back to what Jackie said, you know, we're, we're very focused on the core and whether they're going to open the gates and, and let the water down the river. But there's another bigger problem behind it. And, and it's why is the lake this polluted in the first place? Why do we have a massive algae bloom out there? And it's because of the absolute failure of DEP and the Department of Agriculture and the Water Management District to, to get the lake's nutrient problems under control. We've been working on it since 1989. And it's really no better than it was back then. 
And so while we, we focus on the releases, let's also remember that we've got to, we've got to get agriculture to clean up their act. We got to get cities to clean up their act. We talked about biosolids and they just had a biosolid meeting this morning and they're playing whack-a-mole with biosolids. They're not dealing with them and then they're letting them be dumped in massive quantities all over the state. Uh, and this, this you know, whole idea that pollution is okay, um, it needs to become radioactive. So that's a bigger issue. It's, it's one that we're not covering today, but, but that's something that we all have to keep in mind is, is you know, there's the whole Indian River Lagoon is polluted and only part of it comes from Lake Okeechobee. Um, there's big problems all over and we need to work on water quality and that's a state problem, not the Colonel can't fix that. It has to be our legislature, it has to be our agencies. So thank you. Thanks, that's my Paul. speech for the day. <laughs> uh, it's a good one. It's a good one. In fact, uh, it suggested we get that in writing there. So um, yeah. Can so I ask any... a question? Sure. Uh, how are the sure, snail go... kites? Did the water go down too fast for them or did they have some checks? Um, we're not sure how they're doing. Um, the lake has been dropping so rapidly that it's faster than what we think is okay for kites. Most of them were in deep enough water. Their nests probably were not getting stranded. But even when the water gets shallow, the snails become inactive. And if they have to fly too far, they will leave the nest and, and they will leave their babies to die or they'll leave their eggs to die if they, if they have to. Um, that story's not done being told yet. So we'll, we'll know um, in a few months. But again, it's just one of the many concerns we have to work on. But, but there were 150 kites that nested on Lake Okeechobee this year, um, 150 nests that is. Uh, and that's, we had none last year and none the year before. And the estimate for the snail kite population in Florida last year was it dropped about 20% um, because of the dry conditions and the lack of nesting in, in you know, the two most important places for snail kites, the Everglades and Okeechobee. So um, this year we have had successful nests in the lake and, and there's still some out there. So we'll, we won't know the story on them for until later. So thanks for asking. That's a good point. Um, you know, we just want to just also share the fact that you can see water coming out of the lake going south through at 354, 351, and 352. And primarily that's all getting uh, for the EA um, irrigation and agriculture water supply. You don't see it going through the stormwater treatment areas or any going through these water conservation areas. So consequently, you know, the, the water conservation area 3A is about a foot below, almost exactly a foot below its actual schedule for this time of year. So there is capacity down there and they, if they needed to put more water south, they could get it through the STAs and into the water conservation areas. And I expressed concern on Tuesday's call about them drying this upper area out, which happened before and it got too dry and it's got to be hydrated and keep wet and have that water continue to flow south to uh, Everglades and Florida Bay eventually. But as you can see, what we said, you know, the Clusatchee's taking a lot. Um, St. Lucie is not taking much at all or hardly any. The locks that do open, uh, you know, occasionally bring about 260 CFS. Um, so moving on, let's um, let's get the River Kids update from. Now, I guess Nick Mater might not have been on, but also Todd Weising. Um, uh, Mike or Barbara, did you want to talk about the River Kids yes. activity? They had a big, big show up yesterday, yeah, right? Yeah, it was great. Yeah, Nick um, asked me to speak for her. Um, yeah, we had a great uh, event at the town of Sewell's Point. We had uh, letters and uh, artwork for the kids to send letters to um, Shannon Estenaz of uh, the Office of Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Fish, Wildlife and Parks of the Department of Interior to put um, the manatees back on the endangered list. We probably had 30, 35 kids. We had another 15, 20 adults. Um, we had Al Peffley from CBS. It was on last night at 545. You can also go on their website and see it. Um, and uh, we also had Max Chesnes of is that how you say his name, Max Chesnes of TC Palm? And he was there with his photographer. And then there was a presentation by Michelle Berger of Town of Sewell's Point, how they're dealing with their um, uh, um, resiliency problems and sewage problems and um, on, on Sewell's Point. And she says that their local septics are just failing and going into the water and they really see 
it just building up. Um, it's this bottom of High Point, how everything just goes down from the Atlantic Ridge into um, the IRL. So they're dealing with that. So the children got educated about that. A lot of it was over their head. Um, Keely Mater, uh, who was one of the original River Kids, she was there. She had some of her friends from Pine School that are, you know, on the environmental um, group uh, where our son is the environmental advisor for them. So um, all in all, you know, Nick was worried that no kids would show up and it was a great success. It was, it was, the kids had a blast. And of course we had lemonades and cookies and we always have those at all of our River Kids events. And um, Jackie was there. Um, I, I just, we just had a blast. It was a very, very good event. Just getting it, the word out there. And it's so nice that River Kids can, are, are back in action after COVID. May I just say that to me, it was like a Star Trek film or whatever. It was like the next generation. It was like the next generation of these river kids. I didn't know any, but like two, um, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is 10 years. These river kids have been doing this stuff. The first generation are in college and voting and have bumper stickers on their cars, you know, and it's, it's awesome. Very, and Nick Mater did a great job and you too, Barbara. Thank you. Well, thank you. And everybody got uh, free River Kids t-shirts. So if right. any of you are interested in River Kids t-shirts, contact me. Thank you so much, Barbara and Jackie and Nick. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Merritt was there. Yeah. And, and, and thanks to Max for putting it on the front page today's paper. That was great. Yes, That's great. Merritt was there and has like an award-winning picture with his gorgeous daughter. <laughs> <laughs> That's super dupe. Hey, I, I think Daryl wanted to say a brief thing about in-person meetings before we move on to the rest of the Sorry, community. Sorry, I just want to say the mayor nope. of Seoul's point, um, Ms. Mayfield, Kaya Mayfield, also spoke and was um, wonderful with the kids and oh. uh, we appreciate her presence. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, Mark, All right, Daryl. thank you. Yeah. Um, Everybody, uh, we are, I think the word is getting out and uh, we appreciate the offer from uh, Stewart uh, City Hall to uh, open up their chambers to us again. Um, we are planning next month's meeting uh, in person. And the last I heard from the city manager and I believe at uh, Monday's um, uh, uh, meeting, a uh, city meeting, there was a mask uh, required. Is that correct, Merritt, in the chambers? For that specific meeting, we required them. Um, you know, as we move forward, we're, we're going to follow CDC guidelines. Uh, we all knew that that was a hot topic meeting and we weren't going to restrict capacity in the room. And our decision was to require masks. But moving forward, you know, we're aligning ourselves with CDC guidelines, which is if you're vaccinated, you know, masks aren't required. Um, but again, if you want to wear a mask to feel comfortable, um, we encourage it. Well, thank you. I think, I think so our next meeting, June 24th, we'll be looking at a possibility to have an in-person meeting at the- uh, In March, yeah. And Mark, right. I have a follow-up to that. Um, sure. We, we are, are exploring um, a hybrid Zoom meeting, but at this point, um, I think we have the capacity in Stewart City Hall to accommodate everybody. And if you do have some concerns uh, uh, that you can't make the in-person meeting, maybe you can shoot a, a note off to Barbara um, and if there's a lot of people uh, that show concerns, then um, we might explore a way of just streaming the meeting. Uh, there's that capability, but that won't be an interactive uh, meeting like Zoom. So thank you. All right. Well, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, we're going to move on quickly and, and wrap up here. But um, to basically look at water quality in the estuary, as we kind of mentioned, our water testing weekly shows a pretty good conditions, obviously, in the estuary as far as dissolved oxygen, um, you know, turbidity and those so forth. But I want to caution people that even though this looks good and we've been having ideal conditions for a little while here, 
that it could change pretty quickly um, if we start with discharges. We have seen some seagrass in the outer estuary uh, starting to come back, halophila and some shoal grass. I know uh, Greg had reported north of Jensen Causeway, some halophila. So there are some seagrass communities starting to come back. And what I advocate is let's leave it alone and let's let these resources recover, including seagrass and the oyster reefs. Um, um, Todd, do you have something to share or Jim on seagrass and in, the, in our situation? Yeah, I, can, I can give my quick report and try to be okay. running late here. Yeah. Um, let me get my screen up. Seeing that, I mean, just to recap the conditions of the lake, uh, showing that we're down below 13 feet now, which is in the base flow uh, band. Um, but, you know, nothing coming our way. But I updated this at the last meeting. You might remember there was a gate stuck, and I made a comment that the, you know, the data wasn't uh, connected with the South Florida Water Management District. Their data is actually down and has been down since for like S308. If you're on their website and it's showing that it's S308 is at zero, that's incorrect because you'll notice that it says April 24th as the date of the data. So this is now coming from the Army Corps of Engineers. So I added the West Coast on there, what was Jackie was talking about is, um, you know, right now they're discharging 2343 CFS to tide on the West Coast. I mean, we're being spared, but that's, you know, we're talking about drought conditions and the, you know, the area South being dry and that's a billion and a half, that's a billion and a half gallons a day uh, being wasted to tide and, you know, uh, killing the water conditions over there. Um, so S308 on our side is going into, you know, the C44 basin for storage and for irrigation on this side, but it's not coming to tide. Um, on the uh, conditions too, uh, you all probably saw this satellite imagery on the 11th of uh, May, and that's when it kind of, it was a day like today. And so today might look like this, it might be not as bad, but, um, that was a calm, sunny day. And then the winds kicked up. The winds came out of the east, pushed all the algae over to the west side of the lake, stirred it up, got the algae out of the, off the surface. But today it's dead calm out there again. So it could uh, explode today. So, um, and then real quickly, the, the, there's algae visible you know, on the satellite imagery over on the west side, again, because the, the wind's been going that direction in the last week. Um, but on the seagrasses, um, I've been wanting to get out there. My, I had a little boat issues last weekend, so I've been able to get out there and actually see, you know, what this really is. The satellite imagery is a little sketchy on whether it's uh, grass or not, uh, but there is being, you know, uh, grass reported out there. Um, in some of my prior reports, we talked about the Martin County imagery that they have that's very high resolution and useful. It just showed up the other day. So this is the 2021 um, Martin County's uh, GIS website uh, imagery, you know, but the problem is, is uh, I put the dates down here because I went and because those are the questions last time that was taken between December 18th and January 5th. So that was back when we were talking about how the, the, the grass was completely wiped out. And I said, when the imagery comes out, it probably won't be there. Well, there it is. It's not there. And January was gone. Um, but as we've, uh, as we've progressed through the season, it's gotten, um, better. So, uh, you know, this was that uh, early April when it when you know, it was looking like maybe some grass was coming in. And then there's a, a image just a couple days ago. So this is on the 25th. Um, that appears to be grass coming in, but I want, I want people out there taking pictures and, and uh, reporting back on what's out there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for keeping us up on those images. Uh, yeah, like you said, it is, I've been out there this past weekend on Sunday and it was uh, very, very small, you know, and very sparse of, in those areas that you show um, of both paddle grass, halophila, which is two little blades, paddle grass, and then also the, um, the shoal grass, the Cuban shoal grass, which is very thin, flat blade. So if you are out there and you observe that, I know Riverkeeper and others are out there quite a bit, but 
Thanks for those updates. Appreciate yeah, and then real quick, I mean, it's the end of the water year. The South Florida Water Management District yeah. works in water years, and the end of May is the end of the water year. And so just kind of looking at the discharges at S80 uh, for the water year. Oh, I just moved it. Um, let me go back here. I lost it. Uh, we're ending out 2021, kind of smack in the middle of the last decade. We, we got you know 313,000 acre feet of water through S80 in the last water year. That's about half of those bad years, uh, you know, it's 16 and 18, we got about 600,000 acre feet. So. Yeah, that's a good chart to have to see comparison to other years of what's what's going on. Yeah, I mean, it is really important. And Todd, can you go back a second? Sure. And I think right just for, for some, cause it always takes me a minute, you know, so the water year starts May 1st, from one year to April 30th, the next. So it's kind of, it's not an annual year, it's a water year. And that's the language the core and the district speak. And so when you're looking at the top and it says 2014, you're like, I'm like to myself, God, I remember 2014 as being a great year, but it's because that's more or less 2013. <laughs> remember, which was the lost summer and, and, and terrible. And, and so um, and there it is right there. You can see 2013 when it exploded. And then when we got into 2014, it flattened out. But that was the end of 2014. Right. And then 2017 was was high because of was it Irma, the, the, the water from Irma. And then, you know, the worst year <laughs> ever was, was 2016. And it wasn't even as much water. So it just shows you that it's not just water, it's conditions, you know, what the heat, the stillness, the nutrient level, whatever it is. But um, I remember toxic algae coming out the St. Lucie Inlet into like, they, they documented yeah. it three miles, three yeah. miles oh, out sure. to the ocean because the water was so um, fresh. Sorry. So, so Jackie, real quick, putting that into perspective, um, here it is on calendar year basis where how most of us think. And here's 2016, which was just bat right out of the gate. I mean, at the very beginning of the year, we were already getting hammered and we just got to hammer the entire year. Ugh. But here's 2021 right here. We're way down here at uh, 52,000 acre feet for the calendar year. But that puts us above 2013. Um, and that just shows you that, you know, in 2013, we were very, very low, lower than we were now. And all it takes is a hurricane in July and whammo, you're up to 700,000 acre feet of water and, and all that algae in the river. So we just have to cross our fingers. Oh, it, it really is the tropical systems. All it takes is a storm and we're toast. Thanks, Can Todd. And I, just for a second. Yeah. Really. I, I remember, uh, I think it was 16 that uh, Kenny Hinkle, myself, my sister, and a bunch of the river warriors went down to Jupiter because they didn't, they weren't sure of what was happening. And it was like 10 o'clock in the morning and you could see all the brown coming across the shoreline. Oh, and they go, no. what is that? And that we explained to them that it was the releases, you know? Yeah. And they go, wow. we, that's when we had, they said they had to get interested also. Yeah, wow, amazing. yes, Richard. Well, thanks everybody. Todd, Todd Weising, um, I skipped over you. Sorry about that on the Speakers Bureau. Uh, Todd, what's up? Have a sure. I'll be I'll be brief as I can. Um, Rivers Coalition Speakers Bureau is open for business. We had a meeting. It was a Zoom meeting with the St. Lucie Sailing Club earlier this month. Um, we're we're happy to meet in person. We're happy to meet via Zoom. Any way that we can get our message out to the community. It's great. In order to order or request a speaker, go on to the website and click the nifty request a speaker button. Now on a serious note, all of this meeting, we need all of our community to be informed. And in order for us to have the community informed is for our message to get out. And that's what the Speakers Bureau does. So encourage your organization to request a speaker. We're happy to come out and uh, and bring the message. We're down to the final hour on low zone. So let's get everyone informed. Thanks for a minute. Thanks, Mark. There you go, Todd. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Really appreciate that. We quickly got one more Mike Connor with Indian Riverkeeper and some other announcements. So go ahead, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, I don't need to speak about Lego Vichyov any further today. I think we know where we're at. I think we're, I think we bought some time here. Um, 
don't mean to be myopic on Okeechobee, but that's where the that's where the forest fire has been the last month. There's also some fires to put out up north. I'm spending more time on the on the northern, not the northern IRL, but our northern IRL, which I mean from Jensen Causeway north to Fort Pierce Inlet. And um, I uh, took some photos the other day. Um, th these are really stark, you know, which if anybody has noticed that lives up the drive, they'll tell you that last shot is very telling. That was a former grass flat that I have very fond memories of when I first moved here. Um, I think the picture went away. Um, yeah. But anyway, so just to give you an idea, this is a former grass flat where I, I, I once got so tangled up, I fell wading, wade fishing with Mark Nichols. And this is a flat just north of Jensen Causeway. And this used to be manatee grass and shoal grass. We used to catch trophy sea trout there. And, and what you worried about there was trying to keep your trout on the surface because of a tangle up in the grass, you would lose it. There's not any grass there now. It's all macroalgae. This is very troubling. I had a report about this from Adam Locke. I knew about the uh, macroalgae is blowing. We had an east wind for a long time to fetch. And uh, all, the, uh, all this grass area blew to the west side. This portion, this part is just reeking it's so bad it's turning color and it is a it's an algal bloom it's basically an algal bloom which it doesn't have the uh doesn't have the press that a cyanobacteria bloom does but this is for all intents and purposes an algal bloom going on uh i would say from almost from walton mostly midway road all the way up to uh um old fort park and this is a picture at old fort park um there's so much of that out there in front of that area, and it's just, it smells like a sewage break. I'm looking into this. There's an outfall pipe that comes out from Old Fort Park, and it's not good looking water. And the whole area in front has all this macroalgae um, just laying and rotting at low tide, and it's, it's awful. And the water up there, I gotta tell you, the water, as pretty as it is from Jensen South, the water up there is brown tinged a lot of places. And I think it's partly because of the rotting macroalgae. But this is this is all strips of flat here that used to be covered with shoal grass, and now you have sandbanks further out. And uh, there's probably most of the dock lines, uh, in my memory, and Mark, you've been here longer than I've been here, 23 years. Uh, we used to have grass under the docks, at least two thirds of the way to the shoreline. Most of the docks don't have grass under the tees anymore. It's all receding. It's all receding into deeper water. What is making this is typical. You've got 10 miles of this. Um, it looks like it looks like the Bahamas. Uh, and folks really love it. They, they all tell me, look how great the water looks. Yeah, it looks great. The habitat, you know, I, my, my grade for the week up there, I'm going to give it a C minus because habitat, I give it an F. I'll give the, I'll give the water quality a B plus. But it's, it's really, and that's just both sides of the lagoon. The west side is really bad uh, right now. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact it's concentrated macroalgae over there. It's suspended algae that moves with the wind. And once it settles, it gets stuck and it rots and it crowds out other grasses. This is a typical sample when I get there, typical sample right there, and it's just nasty stuff. So that's one, of, I know we don't have much time left, but that's what I've been looking at. I did go up to Brevard County last night, uh, sat with the uh, Brevard County Inter River uh, Coalition, and they are talking about um, possibly getting the ball rolling on a declaration of emergency and getting to the governor's desk for the entire IRL. Because they spoke of last night, and I spoke, I spoke briefly last night about our state of emergency for Lake Okeechobee for a possible discharge, and their thoughts up there, and they're correct. But there is an emergency there. There already is an emergency. It's being played out as we speak. And it's not just manatees. It's habitat that's caused manatee death. So some very uh, heavy hitters up there in industry and business and tourism business are starting to say something. Um, and I'll be able to report back on that. I'll have some reports about that on our Facebook page, Indian River Keeper, shortly. And I did put a call into Lordy Thompson, uh, just a wonderful environmentally oriented restaurant owner for years and years. And she is taking this, this time by storm. So I'm very interested to talk with her today or tomorrow about that. Otherwise, I think that will cover it for me. Good. May I Thank say you. something? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Laura yeah, Lee Thompson, I just wanted to say she brought something to the attention of everyone. I sit in on that uh, Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Council because of the district. And yep. um, she was talking about, you know, all this resiliency that's happening and all the money that's coming and yay, yay, we have a ton of money. That's great. But that they're planning on just like putting uh, rocks around everything, like rocks all around the causeways and rocks where they think everything's you know uh, receding and uh, she was talking about the horseshoe crabs not having a place to mate 
and, and be and other, you know, hermit crabs, other animals, and then of course, just recreation for people. But I thought that was a really cognizant thing. And it was just timely because she's such an amazing person that we should all be thinking of that too and not letting Martin County destroy every single sand area we have. And if they can refill, um, sorry, but bathtub beach at, you know, one point however many million dollars every year, they can figure out how to put sand on the causeway. Yeah, the, the rocky groins, uh, a lot of us hate that. I, I think it's the, they, it cuts out public access. And like you say, Jack, it's not a living shoreline. It's not a living shoreline, not purely. Um, but that, I agree with you. I agree with you. I wish we had the sandbanks and the access uh, for critters and for people to have access to walk in the water. And I don't and it, know, but it seems like, Mike, that would be part of water quality. You know, I mean, if there's rocks everywhere, that's just going to make it worse for seagrass uh, coming back and the river. I mean, we just have to be, we don't want to do something we can't change back. Yeah, yeah we can we stabilize those shorelines with I know we have you know, to end by and grass beds and living shoreline vegetation too, which we've done. Yeah, so. man mangroves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to let Mike know real quick that outfall pipe that you were talking about. Yeah, uh, tell me. I looked at that. That that is actually an old naturally flowing spring that in the eighteen hundreds used to flow out of the side of the bank of the Indian River, and the old boats would come down and fill up their canteens there with crystal clear water. But it also and probably means the surface uh, water is being polluted. out of the, ever, uh, out of the uh, savannas, and it's now uh, a golf course <laughs> on the other side, and it's flown out of a golf course over there. I know. I saw on Google Earth it is a golf course, and others. Uh, Something's going on in that golf course. Surface waters are being polluted. Well, sure. That's that's a good point. It here's a here's an old historical spring or something, and now it's yeah. going to be polluted Thanks. with, a, with and, and we're, you know, we're pumping sewage into it. Uh, yeah. Just hey, can I say outrageous. something real quick? Okay, yeah, we got I could saying a couple uh, last messages. I, Go I, ahead. I travel up Indian River Drive quite a bit, uh to, up to Fort Pierce. Yeah. And uh boy, can you smell it? Yeah. It is yeah, there's, really, really strong. And I know up, up in Fort Pierce, a couple of the marinas have big algae blooms also. But, uh, Causeway Cove Marina was very chalked, chalked in with that stuff. I went up there four days ago, and maybe the yeah. northeast fetch or northeast winds. I talked to the assistant manager, and she said, it's all gone. And then sure enough, it was. It was all gone, blown out. And I think maybe it's on the west side of the river now, the lagoon, yeah. but uh, it was very they, bad there, yeah. Yeah, they yeah. used their little dinghies and in jet skis and everything and kind of use it to blow it out of the marina and wherever it went is where it went well it's good to observe these any kind of like these macro algae blooms like mike's describing the grassal area the brown stuff or some other lingbia which is more hair like but we even saw uh, sargassum which is an ocean kind of macro algae as you know floats on the surface the golden weed has come into the inlet and actually i saw some around roosevelt bridge yeah. uh, not too long ago so all I mean, the way up into the north we can get tides and winds that push that macro algae in lots of different areas but if it cakes up or builds up it can uh, deplete the oxygen out of the water and it can deplete yep. a lot of sunlight from hitting the natural grass so thanks for keeping an eye sure keep an eye on that mike thanks a lot so uh, any other announcements um Announcements or any other kind of members? Yes, coalition? I have a place. Diane. Um, mm -hmm. Jim, Lord. I'm sorry? No, go ahead, Diane. Okay. Um, our clean water is very important to us. And um, I just want to say that even if we do get uh, Lake O not to send us any more water, we still have the problem where the farms and golf courses along our canals will still have runoff that will come to us. So we do need to work on controlling the amount of fertilizers that are put on there, as well as our own properties. Now I'm working with um, the St. Lucie County commissioners right now to make minor changes in the landscape ordinances. And it's not just about um, stopping the fertilizer from flowing from, you know, being put down from June to the end of September. It's also a matter of um, the amount of water that people put down on their lawns, the pesticides and herbicides that are used, all of that runoff is very harmful to our waterways. 
Um, so what I'm trying to do is promote more uh, trees and shrubs and re, you know try and get people to use 20% or less of the pro landscaping to be lawns. And I am suggesting that all of you do try and look at your landscape ordinances and work with your cities and counties to try and remedy that. Now, I'm giving a lecture tonight for uh, the Sierra Club, Loxahatchee, and if you want to get on their website and sign up for the lecture, you'll hear about all the good things that we can do for ourselves in not only enjoying getting butterflies and birds in your yard, but also the importance of then not using any of these items and that cleans up our water and also helps with climate change. Thank you, Diane. Can you can you put that link uh, to that website in the chat so that everybody can click on it, please? Uh, just, yes, I'll look for just it. Just cut and paste that link into the website and we can click on it. Good luck tonight okay. with that presentation. Yeah. All right. Important. Um, yeah, I just wanted right, to mention that um, the report card for the Indian River Lagoon has come out. That is our score for yes, the IRL. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yep. Um, you know, as as water quality has improved, the habitat is failing. We've lost 740 plus manatees this year so far. This is a crisis. We are in the middle of a collapsing ecosystem and and we need to start being desperately concerned about our failing diversity. It's one thing to talk about toxic algae as an event to our human economies, but we are losing the most biodiverse estuary in North America now. This has to be the top priority. We need to move water south. We need to stop the discharges to the southern end of the IRL. But we've got 146 miles north of us that are in worse shape in terms of, of uh, the water quality and the habitat condition. This is really, 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 really a bad time for the IRL. Um, you know, if you look at, at the, the, the way the DEP has been monitoring the health of the lagoon and the standards by which they've been measuring it, it's, it's a failure. We have, we have not done our diligence. And, you know, we, we are talking about large scale restoration projects that may fail because we don't have the quality behind it to uh, to make it work. You know, we're looking at, at water clarity coming out of the St. Lucie right now, and, and it's quite murky. I mean, we've got suspended solids happening at a time when we're not discharging from the lake because we're dredging the St. Lucie. I mean, these are kind of crazy things that we keep doing to ourselves. And I don't think that we can expect a whole lot of good news if we don't start taking ourselves really seriously about what it is we're doing. I mean, the idea of putting rocks down instead of a living shoreline is to me preposterous. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I think it is to most people on this, on this call. We, we really have to double down on, on what we're doing. So, so please um, make yourself informed, um, do what you can. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been looking at the grass flats for years now and I've never seen as much white sand in the IRL as I see now. Um, it, it, it is really, really, really sad that, that this is, you know, these are, are deserts. They're not living yep. ecosystems. Um, we've lost 87% of the meofauna species diversity in the St. Lucie estuary in the last 10 years. It, 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 we just cannot continue to do this knocking out the base of our food web and expecting the the consumers to be okay. Um, you know, if we don't have a productive baseline ecosystem, we will fail. That's right. That's right. And, and well, I, you know, I, I yeah. go ahead, Mark. Well, Jim, just uh, you're absolutely right on all these points. If is I saw that this uh, report card is coming out June third, I guess. Correct. Is yeah, the Marine Returns can... Council will will have a rollout okay. on June third, and we're our uh, 
joining with the Save the Manatee Club uh, to to urge the the federal government to relist the the manatee, but also you know Grant Gilmore wants nine fish species that are endemic to this area alone that are going to become extinct if they don't get protections under the Endangered Species Act. These are our local things that we need to be engaged in. We need to stop the discharges from the lake, absolutely, and we need to send the water south, but we also need to be able to defend the wildlife in our lagoon. And some of that means taking accountability for our own portion of that responsibility. And that means looking at low impact development. It looks at, looks at what our local runoff issues are. And if we allow some point source you know, discharge of a pollution to our lagoon, we need to stop that. And some of the municipal projects that we are endorsing are contributing to the, the sickness of our lagoon. We don't really know why the seagrass has died. It is a light issue, but it's also probably something else. And, and I just think that we can't let 700 and a half manatees die in one quarter without knowing that we're contributing to that and that, that we need to do something. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um, and as you said, the local runoff, like Diane's comments, are get down to the personal level about on, on our waterfront properties or any properties, as well as our local runoff through C23, C24, and C44 canals and 10 Mile Creek. Those are all point kind of sources that enter in and drain lands that, that have high pollution contents in them. And right. we need to be aware of those as well. I think you, Mark. So, I, I would yeah. also like to point Thanks. out when you're writing to, to um, the people, you know, the, the Army Corps and the other Lowsom um, uh, representatives, remind them that if you are a coastal waterfront property owner, that you are a stakeholder and that you have standing yeah. and that these discharges are pollution to your waterway and that they are responsible for polluting your lifestyle and killing the habitat that makes resilience possible. All right. Well, Rewild the world. Appreciate that. Thanks, Jim, for your diligence on that. And and link up uh, that connection to the report. Yeah, I've, I've, um, I've put it on the, the, or Barbara's put it on the uh, website and we'll send it okay. to Florida Oceanographic. Mike has Sounds it and the city. We'll spread it around. Well. Great. Yep. Thank you. Well, one thanks everybody. Time. I know we got to wrap up. Yeah, Richard, one more comment. Okay. Uh, I remember that when we were all protesting and everything, we were going all over the place, up to Coco and everything, when they had the big fish kill and that. Uh, is there a way that maybe we could get back together with all these areas and make it one big voice? You, know, you mean up the, and down the Indian Lagoon? Yeah. That's, yeah. What the, that's what the coalition is, is it's all of our groups that are connected through this coalition. So take the message okay. back to your group. Yeah. I mean, this is this is part of why you're a member of the Rivers Coalition. That's right. To That's right. expand the influence. Right. That's right. Richard. Uh, you know, it, it, Richard. It was very interesting to do all of that, you know, right. going to all these different places, you know. Richard, Hopefully when COVID you, is uh, gone. Fire, fire up those river warriors and have them show up at the next uh, Rivers Coalition meeting in person, okay? Promise. I'll try. <laughs> okay. I won't be able to be there. I'll be off uh, chasing uh, volcanoes in Iceland, so I'll miss the meeting. So <laughs> okay. if I don't see everybody in person, uh, maybe I'll sign in from Iceland. And uh, Yeah, you should. You should let us away, know what the volcano is. You know? Climate change update okay. from Iceland. Okay. Uh, the it. next meeting is uh, next meeting's, uh, the 24th of June at 11. So again, stay tuned. We may be partially in person or virtual. Well, let's, let's work it out. But in the meantime, attend the Water Management District Governing Board meetings on the 10th. Look for those workshops on LOSUM on the 29th. Do everything you can to stay engaged and involved and communicate all these issues. And if something comes up, send it to Barbara so we can get it onto the, onto the website and communicate that to everybody. So thanks everybody for sticking Thank around a, a little bit longer time. I think it was well worth it. And I appreciate everybody's help in, in getting this going. So thanks, take care. Mark. We'll see you next time. Yeah.
And thank you Bye. for all the panel uh, participants. Appreciate it. Yeah, great panel. Great, Definitely. great panel. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Blair.